Okay, so um, I was asked a question on apathy, exhaustion, health. Uh, I think maintaining willingness, you know, um, and my experiences around all of this in my journey. Uh, you know, feeling like uh, resignation, apathy, uh, and, you know, wanting to know how long it takes as well. A bit of a runny nose today. Uh, and um, the want to be free of suffering. Uh, okay. So definitely had a, a lot of um, a lot of experiences around all of that stuff with kidney failure uh, and dialysis machines and being near death. Uh, there's a few experiences that you know i was um yeah i was i was aware of hawkins work and had met hawkins no i hadn't met hawkins after the kidney failure but um uh but uh, i was aware intensively watching his works and visiting him in america sedona and um so it was really imbuing so when i had my um okay i mean, i can share stuff because you know the the pathway I've taken is that of 12 steps to release addictions, of course, in miracles and you know, self-inquiry. And Dr. David R. Hawkins is my teacher. Uh, I hold him with great love, if that makes sense. And um, and he's my teacher. And he teaches that, um, you know, his sponsor was Bill Wilson, uh, one of the founders of the 12 steps. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah. I think he was also a guide for Mother Teresa, or at least they li liaised. But anyway, uh, you know, I have great, great, well, miracles upon miracles happened after meeting him, the grace of the teacher, and trusting in what he taught me. Um, so the kidney failure left, several illnesses left. But it was, um, and there was a knowing of what to do, but not yet the experience, you know, because, uh, but I was lucky as well that uh, I, I was, uh, I trained as a hypnotherapist uh, before the spiritual work. And so this idea of belief systems and clearing belief systems, and I'd had, you know, the near-death spiritual experience at the at the point of kidney failure, and also white light spiritual experience with uh, a teacher of enlightenment. So I'd had these incredible mystical experiences, and I was studying Hawkins' work. So... And also the mystical, I mean, some of the mystical experiences, which were kind of obvious to me, and maybe I'll share them again, because uh, the mystical experiences recontextualize everything. So I remember seeing uh, one, of, one of my teachers at the time, uh, and uh, I had a one-to-one -one meeting with him. I'll just describe this. So, um, and on, on the day that I had the meeting, I had a gout attack in my feet, a horrific pain. And my ego was telling me to just cancel the appointment. There was a huge terror of the death of the ego. I, I kind of understood it. It just blew up my body. It just didn't want. It didn't want to be finished forever. Uh, and just being, you know, in, with a teacher, just doing self inquiry alone with nowhere to escape, was uh, terrifying for the ego. It, it really feared for its uh, existence. And so it, you know, it's it manufactured all these illnesses and all these negative thoughts. You know, you've got you can't walk. Your pain, your foot swollen up. Just ring him up and say you can't do it today. Um, and uh, anyway, there was something deeper that knew it was my chance. You know, that's what I, I wanted. Um, I don't know how to explain it. There was something more deeper that said, "Don't miss your chance." Uh, uh, it's not a verbal thing, but there was a knowingness. Not whatever it took, and it was even worth it if I died on the way there. Then so be it. Uh, that was that was a that was if that's what's required but don't miss your chance for liberation uh even if uh so um yeah i do remember the journey it was horrific you know absolute agony uh with a pain inflamed with a, a massive gout attack if anyone's had gout attack if you try and walk on that um it's horrific pain i remember being told off in the tube station when i was almost falling down and the tube staff came and said you, sh you shouldn't have come in here you know, you're wrong to have come in here. You're a liability to all of us if you die in here. So, you know, it, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a pleasant journey. Anyway, um, somehow through some miracles, I managed to get there and uh, sat down in front of the teacher. And, uh, and okay, this is the important bit around health and apathy and all of this stuff and, and exhaustion. 
So I walked in with horrific gout in my feet, almost unable to walk. It seemed like a dark day uh, to me. It was actually an autumn day. It was actually what normal people would call a dark day. Uh, so there's horrific pain, horrific mental obsession, and sat in front of the teacher, the fear of the loss of the ego, because the teacher was interested in the death of the ego, like chop, chop, let's kill this off and let go of all this rubbish that you're holding on to. So um, I, I was familiar with the self-inquiry practice, and he said, like, you know, where are you? I said, well, I'm aware there's an, a witness behind me. And he just said, um, uh, he said, well, what's behind the witnesser? And then uh, as I went into, as I went behind the wit, the wit, what was behind the witnesser, he asked me. So there was the inquiry then, what is actually behind the witnesser? How, did, how come there's a me and there's a witnesser behind me? But he asked, what's behind that witnesser? Because I was reporting that there's an experience of a witnesser and there was a sort of an experience of a me in front of the witnesser. And then suddenly, um, it's, it's really, oh, I'll describe it anyway. Um, Suddenly, the whole world, this whole world disappeared. There was no thought. There was no me. There was no world. There was no memory, uh, and it was like infinite light and love. Uh, and um, it, the, the light and the love was so intense um, that it's obvious that there can be never any thought that exists there. No memory can exist there. No thinking can exist there. No this and that. Could even be possible to exist there. And my closest analogy is: imagine being in the middle of the sun and trying to see a shadow or anything. It's not possible. There is nothing. The, the the light is so intense that nothing else exists except light and love, uh, and nothing else could ever exist or or exist ever in that place of infinite light and love. Um, but somehow. Um, the seeming possible happened it seemed like something like a thought was trying to emerge in the, in the intensity of light and love and there was somehow some kind of identification with that and then suddenly the world there was a witnessing of the world but there was extreme bliss and ecstasy uh and you know almost like the body couldn't move even though the the teacher sort of knew that there wasn't going to be much talking from, from it, it was blissed out. Uh, so he just sort of shoved me out the door. Um, and um, and it's hard to describe because, you know, what happened, you know, because this is the thing on the illness and the gout and the pain and the suffering and all this rubbish, is that after being in the infinite light, uh, now I was in absolute ecstasy. Uh, there wasn't a me. It was just the witnessing of bliss and ecstasy and oneness. And it was like the world was in technicolor. It was like the most brilliant sun, you know, had come in in pain, agony, uh, limping. And now it was like the, 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 the most extreme sunny day with everything in absolute vivid technicolor. And the body sort of um, walked along and um, eventually in the tubes in Brookton's tube station, it was just tears coming down as everything, every person was just so exquisitely beautiful. There could only be tears. Now, here's the thing. So a lot of things shattered and made sense from um, Hawkins' work on exhaustion, illness, kidney failure, uh, lethargy, apathy, uh, was that there was no pain in the feet that had that had totally gone. Um, the, the world had become um, in technicolor. Uh, there was no self. It was absolutely the most extremely um, beautiful experience. There was no really time or me existing. So, and there was no pain. There was no body. There was no thoughts. So, um, so what is all this exhaustion? And I'm so exhausted. And what about all these? Ill I've been diagnosed with all these illnesses. Oh my God! I've got an inflamed foot with gout. But all of that disappeared. So it doesn't exist if one is immersed in the light. In fact, it all starts disappearing and healing up at a very rapid rate, the, um, a, rate um, a rate that can only be called miraculous, even beyond science. Um, even science ha hasn't got the capacity to do what happened there. Uh, so, so, all of, so what is it? So what is all this apathy? And I did go through extreme apathy. I remember being on the on the dialysis machines uh, um, and I remember towards the end they were just increasing the number of bags of fluid 
you have to lift up onto the machine uh, to do the dialysis over the night. And I remember one day I was losing strength as, you know, the, 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 the life was sapping out of me with all this dialysis, even to lift up the bags. It was just getting too much for me to lift up all these bags onto the machine every night. And, and, the, and it was like the, the, the number of bags I had to lift up was increasing over time and I was getting weaker over time. And then there was an extreme kind of exhaustion, su a suicidalness. It's like, what's the point of existence? You know, um, I can't, my body's getting weaker. I can't lift up the bags to di dialyze myself with these machines. And there was a darkness, a suicidal darkness. And, uh, but I still, I had been doing the, um, the cancer release, watching Hawkins stuff. And uh, all I can say is that it's usually, with these type of things, there's usually a dark night of the soul experience just before you get freedom. And you have to sort of, um, you have to have faith to go through. It's like just before the end, uh, the ego does really pull in all the stops, you know, for suicide, depression and, and hopelessness. But my, my experience has always been go through that with faith. It doesn't make sense what I'm saying. And usually quite soon the miracle happens uh, and, it, and, and it did. Uh, uh, so I had a transplant, everything rectified, the light came in and the health problems disappeared and all that illness and apathy and exhaustion. So now there's a few things I want to say on this um, exhaustion and apathy and the loss of willingness. Yeah, um, I'm speaking at different levels of consciousness. So when one is in the apathy, the exhaustion, the unwillingness, the physical pain, um, it it does require what I call, um, and I really, there, there was a, a YouTube video, I think it's been taken down of Hawkins, where he says at the end, it's one pointedness of mind, like a real tenacity to keep going, even if, uh, even no matter what, no matter how bad it gets, you still keep going in faith. Uh, and you keep taking those actions, you know, for him, it was like the, you know, staying in the silence, no matter what, even if the body died, you still carry on until the end. And uh, either the light comes or the body drops off. So you just go through that. And that's sometimes the thing that needs to develop to clear the, I would, in a simplistic term, to clear the addiction to being in all the negativity of the thoughts, uh, the identity of the body, all the illnesses, the gravity. So, um, so it did work. I really believe all those cancelling of beliefs, sitting with the feelings and watching Hawkins for many years did work. But at the end, it's like the ego puts up a huge battle towards the end. Just be willing to go through that. That's to be expected. Uh, like, the, you know, to walk through the valley of death in faith. Uh, and then it clears. It's like a last challenge from the ego. So, um, the okay, so tips on getting through exhaustion. And another experience I wanted to show, because it was arts, was my experience, was that I found that um, not doing spiritual work when you're in the dark is not a good idea. I had that with my kidney failure. Um, when I had, uh, sorry, with my operation, I had my operation for my transplant, and um, and I was absolutely exhausted after the operation in the hospital bed. And I, my ego just said, look, I won't do any spiritual work for a few days. I deserve a rest. Um, and very quickly, uh, I, you know, because I was, I, I was still in early recovery from food addiction, you know, the obsession was back on me. Uh, and, uh, and then I realized that, you know, when it's really, really dark, you still have to do the spiritual work until the light comes. Now, when we're talking about different realms, how do you get to the light? Well, what, why is it so difficult? to get to the light or the observer well it's the it's the momentum you know as a hypnotherapist I, I think it's relatively easy to see it's an addiction to being in the head in in self story in beliefs around illness uh, and uh, and there is a deep core idea that the life one experiences i.e being in thoughts and being a body is what one is you know it, it, it it's the experience has always been that is me I am my thoughts, my identity, and this body. Um, this is my life. I am. I am the identity and the body. And there's a, a, a unwillingness to let that go, uh, because it, it, you know it, it might be dark, it might be depressing, it might be full of addictions, but it's an entertaining. You know all that suffering and guilt and shame and 
anger and whatnot and being a body and seeing others as bodies um so there's a great um you know with everything there's an attraction and aversion so there's a great attraction in overcoming that huge attraction to being identified with thoughts the body and the story of this world is like a, a it's like to let that go for the for the inner light um you know as saint francis says in dying one is born to eternal life the eternal uh or what one you know as saint francis says what you're looking for is where you're looking from it's not if you keep looking at your thoughts and the body and keep looking at other others as bodies and thoughts and this world as being the truth of your existence then uh, that has to be willing to be sacrificed so there is uh, and the, the ego does fight back it doesn't want to let so it will suddenly create illnesses psychosomatic illnesses all kinds of um, situations can arise so it's developing that tenacity. Uh, what I would say, and I think you can see it from uh, Hawkins' work, is um, when the going gets tough spiritually or with illness or with a uh, thing, is, um, it's the opportunity for maximum spiritual growth. And, sp uh, and sometimes spiritual growth is going through long periods of darkness and doing the work. So... Hawkins actually said a lot, most of his illness le left within three to five years of cancelling and doing the Course in Miracles. He had 23 illnesses, many of them life-threatening. And actually, funny enough, uh, you know, for whatever reason, it took me three to five years of cancelling and sitting and doing the self-inquiry. And then my three illnesses at the time left, the kidney failure, um, kidney, kidney failure and gout and asthma. Uh, and um, so um, so it takes a lot of time to undo sometimes in my experience very entrenched um, entrenched um, belief systems um, anyway I could go on for a long time but um, okay oh yes there's one last thing sorry I've gone on a long time this video so I want to be free but I also just want to do this work just to escape the pain and I just want to talk about what I call um, I mean, this thing of like just doing enough spiritual work to be free of pain, but still to be an ego afterwards. And I think there has, uh, at some point, I'm not saying everyone has to do this, but at some point, it's like when you make a bargain with the ego, like I'm just going to do enough spiritual work to get out of pain, then I can go back to my head and being a, a sort of a, a unidentified body in my story. I'm just going to do enough. So whatever it takes, I'll cancel and pray until I'm out of pain. And then I can carry on being my usual identity. I, what usually, and my experience with that is at a certain point, I think that does work a lot in early early years. But at, in my experience, at a certain point, you realize that's not enough. The ego will always grab you back. So you just do a little bit of spiritual work. You get some relief. And then you stop doing the spiritual work. Or you don't want to fully surrender to the infinite. To being there all the time so you just go back to the usual head and i usually find that with my head it will torture me again with something it's like okay you did enough work i'll leave you alone for a few weeks and then you start thinking and then it, it just hits you again on the head with something so for me for me as well you know, i think from my experience in this world there's a thing of like the infinite like bargaining with the infinite like I want to do a bit of spiritual work and I want bliss in two minutes. So all of these little belief systems or bargaining or conditions uh, and how I do it is like I, sur I will surrender everything to the infinite um, and expect nothing in return. If I don't get bliss back, that's fine. Um, if it's, if it's, if it's hard forever, that's fine, but I won't continue. I won't continue the devotion to let everything go, uh, even if I don't get any rewards. And I think that is required. Uh, and, you know, I'm talking on the thing of like just doing enough work to get out of pain, but getting to this deeper surrender, and not a surrender like, OK, I, I will really, really surrender to the infinite, but I want relief in 10 minutes or I want to be blissed out in 10 minutes or I want all my goodies. Not that kind of thing. There has to be a deeper surrender that the surrender is unconditional no matter what how hard it is how long it is or whether one doesn't get rewards or not so there has to be um, a deeper surrender otherwise for me it, the ego just gets you back again it's like 
well, you did this, you did this counseling of beliefs and praying and self-inquiry for 10 minutes or a few hours today or on a retreat uh, and you felt good, but then, um, you know, you want the rewards. I wanted the rewards forever. So let's forget it and just go back into the usual identity. So for me, that thing, I think it's normal for humans just to do it as a temporary measure and not want to go deeper. But for me, deeper fields of surrender at a certain point, because, you know, the ego for me will always bite you back in my experience. So at a certain point, if you want to be totally free, then the willingness has to come to be totally free, not not to go back to the drug of thinking and, and the body and the, the world of illusions. Okay, so I'm going to stop.